the skies are blue, the sun is shining, and I'm about to go on the most fabulous and very original journey around Britain. And what makes it so unusual is that it's not actually today's Britain I'll be seeing, but the Britain of nearly 2,000 years ago, when this country, or most of it, was part of the Roman Empire. So, while I'm having fun up in the air... I'll be having an equally great time here on the ground, tracking down the fascinating remains of Roman Britain that are still all around us. We'll be revealing the world of the Romans like you have never seen it before. Finding bits of Roman London hidden away where you'd least expect. It's pretty much the most impressive piece of the Roman War that I've ever seen. From the air, we can see how Roman streets and towns sit cheek by jowl with 21st century Britain. And we uncover some of the dirtier truths about everyday life on Hadrian's Wall at the edge of the Roman Empire. It's just huge! This is the story of what life was like back then, for the Romans and for the Britons. Roman Britain is under our feet. It's in the country's great museums. But the most exciting way to see it is... From the air. Later in our journey, we'll visit Wales and the north of England. But our story starts in London. Believe it or not, London is a Roman invention. There was nothing here until the Romans arrived. They built it all from scratch. In 43 AD, the Romans landed an invasion army of 40,000 men on the Kent coast. Just four years later, they started work on a new town they called Londinium, exactly where today's City of London stands. Of course, with all the crazy chaos of modern London, it's easy to forget that every day we walk in the footsteps of our Roman ancestors, and their city lies just a few feet underground. So how much do you know about Roman London? Very little, if I'm being completely honest. Michael knows his stuff on the Romans, but I've got a lot to find out. What London looked like then, who lived in the town, and really fascinating, why the Romans built the town here. First off, I want to know what's left of Roman London, so I've asked archaeologist Nick Bateman to join me in the air. So, Nick, what can we see today of what is left of, of the Roman streets? Well, Roman London actually lies buried anything between 10 and 20 feet below the level that we walk on nowadays. However, the key elements of the Roman streetscape are actually mirrored and reflected uh, in, in modern streets. From up here, it's really obvious. The Romans were famous for building straight roads. And down below us, where all those buses are, there is one. London's most famous shopping street, Oxford Street. The Romans knew it as the Via Trinobantina, and it headed west towards South Wales. At the far end is Marble Arch. Even in Roman times, this was a hub of several roads, including what we call today Edgware Road, a major Roman highway to the north. Roman towns usually had a simple plan. As well as the straight roads, a large town like London would need a fort and a town wall. So, could there be any signs of those that I can spot from the air? Most of the Roman wall has gone, but I'm told there's a section of it still standing somewhere near the Tower of London. Well, I can see the tower, so where's the Roman wall? Absolutely spectacular. It is incredible, Nick, after all these years, that you can still manage to rediscover parts of the Roman world, really, here in central London. Pretty so. amazing, isn't it? By some miracle, this section of the huge Roman wall that surrounded London has survived. So what happened to the rest? I'm right in saying, Nick, that there is part of the wall in underneath 
the grind. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we can't see it from up here, obviously, but I'm hoping Michael is down there investigating it right now. Well, this is weird. I'm in an NCP car park in the heart of the city, and I'm joining archaeologist Neil Faulkner, who claims there's a Roman surprise in store for me just up ahead. In you go. Fantastic. What a place. I have never seen this before. Face to face with Roman London. This is the western wall of the Roman fort, Londinium's military headquarters. What's that over there? That looks like a very different kind of structure. That is the AD 200 wall that goes right the way around the city. Yeah. What they do is they incorporate the fort into the city wall. Let me show you on the map. Okay. It's much clearer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it gets incorporated into this huge great wall running all the way around the city. So that's covering everything from you know what is today here's St Paul's Cathedral yep. all the way over to what, Tower, Tower of London. London. Yeah. So it's the whole of the kind of what becomes the city of London as we know it. It's frankly astonishing just how much of the Roman London wall is visible in London's underground car parks. Here we are in Bay 52, and in amongst the motorbikes and the cars, it's pretty much the most impressive piece of the Roman Wall that I've ever seen. Not only its height gives you a real sense of just what an extraordinary structure this was, but we also get the chance to see these red tile courses that run at regular intervals that gave the wall extra strength and stability. With finds like this, I'm well on my way to becoming a Roman Wall addict. The wall was 20 feet high and up to 9 feet thick. It surrounded London on just three sides because the fourth boundary was the River Thames. Up here you get a unique sense of how the river still defines London today. But 2,000 years ago it looked very different and presented a real challenge to Roman engineers. What we're looking at now is, is a relatively constrained and narrow river. It's embanked on both sides, and those embankments have made the river deeper and much, much narrower uh, than what it was when the Romans came. The north bank um, has moved a fair amount, and in fact, where the river bank was in the Roman period is more or less along the line of Lower and Upper Thames Street. But the south bank, the change is even more extraordinary. What we look at now was a series of small islands and tidal marshy ground. The tidal basin might have been as much as a mile in width. By threading their way through from, from island to island, they could throw a bridge across, a timber bridge. It then becomes a very handy place to start a very effective port and harbour. And it was because they could put a bridge across the Thames and build a port that the Romans sighted their town here. The bridge was almost on the site of today's London Bridge and it enabled them to join up trade routes from the south with their roads going north. And the port brought in international trade and linked Roman Britain to the world. By the end of the first century, London's population was approaching 30,000. People from all over the empire came here to trade and to make money. The Romans have left us lots of evidence of their wealth, and the finest collection of Roman luxuries is here at the Museum of London. There are very few artefacts that you can say were categorically used by women, but this is actually a jar of cosmetics. The cosmetic is still in it from 2,000 years ago. And this was found in a ditch of a temple complex in what is now South London. Can we look inside, Caroline? We can look inside, but I must warn you, it doesn't look like it was when it was found. When it was found, it was still wet. Really? But for conservation reasons, we've allowed it to dry out. Oh, wow. So that is, we're looking at 2,000-year-old face cream. Yes. That is just incredible. And in fact, 
there was evidence of the fingerprints, as we all have, us girls in our moisturising pots and you dip your hand in, that's exactly the, the state that you find this Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Let me show you a picture. So this is what it looked like when it was found. Oh, my goodness. And you can see, literally, somebody has scooped a finger in. And how old are we thinking this is? Um, this is, you know, nearly 2,000 years old. You know, and everything that women do today, from cleansers to face packs to hair removal to eyebrows to plucking, you know, it was all done 2,000 years ago. Nothing is new. Well, you learn something new every day. I had no idea Roman London was so sophisticated. But there was a dark side to Roman London. Underneath here at the Guild Hall in the very heart of London's financial district, there's something truly extraordinary. Michael has promised me I won't believe what I'm about to see. But this feels very strange, I have to say. It's all modern. So where is he taking me? It's a bit of a, a rabbit warren, isn't it? But... Incredibly, 20 feet under modern London, there's a Roman amphitheatre. And to show us around, we're back with archaeologist Nick Bateman. What we're walking down now is the main entranceway for the people who were participating, fighting or dying in the arena. We're now crossing the threshold into the arena itself. The arena, obviously, sand, open, completely open to the skies. And behind us, rising up behind us there, um, if you can imagine the, the curving wall that surrounds the arena, standing at least about two metres high, and then above that, raking backwards on all sides, the timber seating for the spectators. Maybe about five, 6,000 spectators all around us. So little remains of the original building, but they've tried to help us imagine it with these visual effects of the seating and even the fighters in the arena. Well, I'm impressed. I can just hear the roar of the crowd, a bit like a football match but it's hard to get a sense of scale down here. What sort of events would have taken place here, Nick? Well, I think almost anything and everything, really, and this would range from uh, theatrical experiences like jugglers and tumblers, maybe clowns even, right the way through to all the gory things that people know about from films like gladiators. It is quite difficult to imagine just how big this place would have been. It, it, it is, actually. I mean, the remains are, are pretty scant, really, when you look at it. But I think the best way to, to, to get a, a feeling of that is actually from the air. So just how big is this arena? Well, I, I think you can see now uh, pretty clearly as we're, as we're looking directly down the curving black line in the square that follows the curvature of the inner wall of the amphitheatre, the elliptical arena of about 60 metres by 40 metres, quite a big space. You would have seen this for miles. This, this would have stood out. This amphitheatre would have been such a central part of this area. I think it would have been. I mean, it's a pretty large building uh, in Roman London. What a town London must have been, full of hustle and bustle, dirty, noisy, an international melting pot. From the late first century, Londinium sent out a message to the surrounding country. This is a Roman town and it's here to stay. It was the financial heart of Roman Britain, the seat of Roman government, and it later became the capital of the country. Beyond London, it was very different. Out to the west and in the north, there were British tribes who wanted nothing to do with the times and nothing to do with Roman rule, and they were capable of making the Roman lives hell. We're heading west now, following the M4, roughly the way the old Roman road took you to Bath and then the Welsh borders. 
Now, most of lowland Britain was conquered fairly easily in about three years or so, but Wales and the north proved much more troublesome. And we're heading towards one of those tribes that really gave the Romans a lot of trouble, the Silurians, who decimated legions and resisted Roman governors for nigh on 30 years. To get the troops to travel spots, the army built a system of really substantial roads that fanned out from London. These roads would have been a hard compound of clay, chalk and gravel, sometimes capped with large paving stones and always brilliantly engineered to last. A Roman legion was over 5,000 men. On a good day, they could cover 20 miles and the march to Wales from London would have taken them about a week. As they approached Wales, they came up against the huge barrier of the River Severn. It was too wide to build a bridge, so they created a ferry point, and archaeologists have found hundreds of Roman coins here, offerings to the river gods to ask for a safe passage across. So we're flying over the very route the Romans took to Wales. Drivers on this bridge probably haven't a clue that they're above one of the most ancient river crossings in the country. To see how determined the Romans were to put their stamp on this area, we're now looking for the amazing fortified town of Caerleon. And we're approaching it now, just up ahead. This is where the Roman soldiers were based for their long campaign against the Celtic tribe, the Silures. In the early days, they camped here in leather tents, but once they'd conquered the Silures around 75 AD, they built a stone fort. The second Augustan legion were stationed here, and amazingly nestled in amongst the trees and houses, you can still see their barracks the best remains of a Roman legionary barracks in Europe. Now I know Roman buildings are all about rectangles and straight lines. So what are these stone circles doing here? Michael's on the ground to investigate. This whole area between the ramparts and the perimeter road was reserved for cooking. The soldiers would have been out along here with their own little individual bronze saucepans, cooking on fires, making whatever they could. But the bread, that was baked centrally in these baking ovens. Talk about feeding the 5,000. These barracks were part of a huge fort covering 50 acres. But why did the Romans think this was the best place for their military HQ? Christine can possibly answer that from the air with the help of landscape archaeologist Steve Rippon. Just how much thought did they put into what they built and where they built it? Um, they put a huge amount of thought into that. Um, if we actually look at the landscape around here, the fortress is built on um, an area of flat ground in what is otherwise a very, very hilly location. And the second criteria was that it was by the River Usk. And it was the, the River Usk that enabled them to sort of connect to the seven estuary, hence why the Roman fortress was built here. It all seems quite simple though, from this perspective, doesn't it? We can see everything, we, we can see why it made sense. However, if the Romans wanted to settle here, they needed to secure their food supply. That was a huge challenge. But their engineers and land management were second to none. And it's up here that you can see how they solved the problem. The area that we're flying across now um, is an area known as the Gwent Levels. It's a large area of a low-lying wetland. And in uh, the early Roman period, this was just a uh, salt marsh. It was pretty valueless land. And they transformed that sort of tidal marsh into very, very fertile freshwater agricultural land. These are the fields. This is a really nice example down here, actually, of these incredibly long, narrow fields. And these fields are actually divided by very substantial drainage ditches. So this was, it was a major feat of engineering to actually embank and drain this land. And I think it's remarkable. Farmers are still exploiting fields that have a Roman origin. These fields are about 1,700 years old. That is absolutely incredible, Steve. 
What I love about seeing all of this from the air is that unlike over London, you can pick out each of the elements that made up the Roman settlement. The barracks, the fort, the agriculture, and then down below us now, just behind that Welsh farm, is a massive Roman amphitheatre. And it's just so impressive, even today. Wow. This is extraordinary. It's the best preserved outdoor amphitheatre in Britain from the Roman period. And it's when you get down here on the ground of the arena where the gladiators and the beasts and the criminals were that you really get a sense of the awe-inspiring, intimidating feeling this place has. This place could hold, we think, something like 6,000 people. That was the entire legion and more. And while I'm sure Christine from the air will get a great sense of its size and scale, for me down here, you get a real sense of what it was like to be here, to be a spectator, and perhaps even to be the spectacle. And of course, the other way to entertain yourself as a Roman soldier was the baths. And this is it. Loving the visual effects as well. Now, this would have been completely open to the elements back in Roman times, so pretty chilly, I would imagine. It's really big. It's over 100 feet long, and it took over 80,000 gallons of water to fill it. A visit to the baths was more like going to a spa today. Soldiers expected to enjoy chatting with friends as well as exercise. And it wasn't just the soldiers having a good time. We tend to think that Roman baths were just for men, but that wasn't so, at least here in Curly, and it wasn't the case. Women and children definitely used these baths. And when archaeologists excavated here, they, they found hairpins and jewellery. They even came across children's baby teeth. There was a drawback, though. They had to bathe really early in the morning before the soldiers, and it was absolutely freezing. Over time, the two communities, the invading Romans and the native Silures, got used to living side by side. The Silures found there were benefits to trading with the Romans, and some local people went further. This is Julius Valens, and he was a vet. He was a veteran from the Second Augustan Legion, the Legion here at Kellian. And he lived, Vixit, until he was 100 years old. And this tombstone was set up for him by his wife, Julia Secundina, the conjunct, the wife. And we've also got his wife's tombstone up above. And that tells us that she died when she was 75 years old. That's more than just a case of older man takes younger woman. What that probably means we're looking at is that a veteran took a local woman as his wife. And veterans were pretty good catches in those days. They were well off and any children they had would eventually get Roman citizenship. We're beginning to get the picture of these local Silures settling down and living with the Romans, some here at Caerleone, and some at the new town the Romans built for them, down the Roman road at Caerwent. And that's where Christine and I are off to now. But the original Roman road from Caerleone to Caerwent is missing. It was roughly eight miles long, and I want to see if there are any remains of it left on the ground today, and try to retrace the footsteps of the soldiers who travelled from their garrison to the new town. Most of the way, the line of the Roman road is the same as the modern A road, but there's a section where it's different. All physical evidence of the old road has gone, but with the help of Steve's maps, I'm hoping we can find where it went. What you need to do um, is to keep a, a, an eye out for a signpost for the Usk Valley Walk, which is a, a public footpath that follows the route of the old Roman road. Michael, we're slightly losing you in and out of the trees right now, but you are on the right way. It looks like you may have to abandon the car over. Until the 19th century, the old Roman road from Caerwent to Caerleon actually ran through what is now this golf course 
and through this woodland. And most of the local people here probably have got no idea whatsoever that the footpath that Michael's following, it originated as a Roman road. This is not what I was expecting of a Roman road. Sorry, Michael, we have completely lost you in amongst the trees there. Sorry, over. Hopefully we will find him in part three. Michael is making his way, I assume, up Chepstow Hill. We have completely lost him in amongst the trees just now, but I'm hoping he is still on the Roman road to Kerwent. Yeah, this area here, if you can see it, there's a much wider gouge in the side that runs all the way from down there, up in a pretty straight line, all the way up. Now, that could well be the remains of the Roman road going from Kelio to Kerwent and on to Gloucester. He's on exactly the right line, coming up to the golf course here, and then he's just past the, um, the reservoir, and then the Roman road actually becomes the modern road from Kerwent to Kerlian. Sorry, we're just looking for a Roman road. You don't know a Roman road near here, do you, by any chance? No, very <laughs> That bit of road that Michael's on now, that is actually pretty much the line of the Roman road. That's fabulous. What well, great news to be in the footsteps of all those legionaries so many centuries ago. I know we can't actually see the remains of the Roman road, but it is incredible that after all this time, we can still find where it went. One of the most magnificent things about our country is its maps. They preserve the most ancient history for us. So if you want to follow a Roman road, you can. On to Kerwent. And we're approaching it now, one of the most perfect remains of a Roman market town anywhere. What the Roman authorities did when they had conquered an area was to establish um, a, a town, and each town was where the landowning elite would have been asked to set up their local government. And Kerwent was the, um, the county town, if you like, of the Siluris. This was the first Roman town in Wales. They called it Winter Silurum, the market of the Silures. People would have flocked here from all over the region. It's now a small village, but for 300 years, it had the largest civilian population in Wales, all living in a Roman-style town. Down below would have been the Forum and the Basilica. Would this have been there? I mean, what? This is the forum. Now, it's a kind of Roman term, but it means a big open market space. And this is where people would come, not just to buy and sell, but also to meet one another okay. and, and chat about what was going on, what the local news was, catch like up. It's a social thing. Yeah. As well as if you were a farmer, for instance, then you would come here with your produce. Yeah. Um, how would you exchange it with other farmers? I mean, how, how did trade work then? Well, increasingly, it would have been, it would have been coinage based. I mean, oh, really? the local tribes had been getting used to to dealing in money, in coin, with the Romans over a long period of time. And by the time this place is built, I mean, we're in the second century AD, they're, they're fully versed in it. So money as we know it yeah. started here, really, in yeah. this time, this is what they knew as well. Yeah. So where does this lead us into then? Ah, right, OK, well, I mean, you can see the ancient steps here, right, that would have led up to uh, this front wall, you can see it, which would have towered. I mean, this building would have towered above everything else in the town. So everything from here on to the back wall you can see there, this is what's known in Latin as the Basilica. This is the town council. This was where the governing happened. This would have been an absolutely kind of fundamental, if you like, power space. Um, it wasn't the Silures that built this place. So that, that was the Romans. They were the power behind this. Yeah, engineers and architects from the Legion came down here and gave the expertise for how to build this place with a bit of local muscle and bring yes. in local stone. Um, so they're creating a framework, if you like, a Roman framework in which locals can live in a, in a very Roman-esque way. Round the corner from the Basilica is a very different building. From the air, it looks pretty odd, but actually this is a pagan temple built around 330 AD. 
It's a series of courtyards with at the centre what they call the keller, the inner sanctum, where only priests were allowed. This is like walking into a church today. This yes. is your kind of first entrance. It in. is indeed. Yeah. And who are we worshipping? Who's the god? We're not quite sure. The temple's being a bit secretive about it, but it may very well be a god that we know was worshipped here called Mars Oculus. OK, now Mars, I've heard of, that's the Roman god of war. Yes. Oculus, a British god, a British divinity? He's a Gaulish god. He comes from France, but he was adopted here. It's a form of mixing of cultures. You are part of the Roman Empire, but you are a Briton, and you keep both identities. Religion is mirroring society, and that's always the case. But there's something else I want to show you. Ah, OK, right, I'll follow you. So, Miranda, what have we got here? It's a curse. It's a spell. And it's made out of lead. It has an inscription, it, it has writing on it, which is a message to the goddess Nemesis about somebody who's stolen somebody's cloak and boots. The original curse was deliberately made difficult to read because it was intended for the goddess's eyes only. And sadly, with the time that's passed, it's become invisible to anyone who isn't an expert. The prayer is from the victim saying that the person who's done this has got to pay for it with his life's blood. With his life? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, this, is, this is death for cloak and boots? Absolutely. Not sure that I'm that keen on Roman religion. Sounds a little bit like black magic to me. But I guess what's so remarkable about the remains in South Wales is that they tell us about almost every aspect of life. Remarkably, we can even work out where those cloak and boots might have been bought. Sitting like next door neighbours to the homes in today's village is a street of Roman shops. At one time, 3,000 people lived here. This was the centre of trade and business in South Wales. And in the 4th century, to show off its prosperity, Kerwent gave itself a massive town wall. Hey, Christy. There How are you, you are. <laughs> Aren't they amazing? So impressive. How high up am I? Uh, you're about 17 feet up on the top of the wall. Oh, that makes my head go a little bit funny. I don't like it. <laughs> the walls of Kerwent once stretched for over a mile round this town. Today, they are the best preserved Roman town walls in Britain. You look pretty impressive on those walls, Christine. But if you like walls, there's only one wall to see. In part four, we're going to be finding out what the Romans did in the north of England. We're off to Hadrian's Wall. This is the world famous Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland. It's one of the Roman Empire's greatest architectural and military achievements. We've all heard of it, but it's only from the air that you can see the sheer size of it. Originally 73 miles long, it stretches from Newcastle in the east to Carlisle in the west. So what was it for? Some think it was an absolute boundary. This was, you know, no one came beyond this wall. Yeah. Others think it's a much more porous thing. People going to and from trading, more like a tax point. It does look defensive to me, that's for sure. There's certainly forts everywhere here. I mean, you, you would sort of go with that as well. Yeah, and I definitely want to get down to see a couple up close. So that's the plan. Between us, we've got some big questions to answer. Why were the Romans here? What was the wall's ultimate purpose? And what was life like for the Romans and the Britons at the edge of the Roman Empire? It's a truly amazing survival, this wall, and it marks the limit of the Roman conquest of Britain. Several times the Romans tried to conquer Scotland, and always they were driven back. This wall became the final frontier. In places, the wall was up to 20 feet high and 8 feet thick, and it's said to have taken the manpower of three Roman legions, the 2nd from Caerleon, the 6th and the 20th 
around six years to build. At every Roman mile, there was a mile castle fortlet. Life on the wall could be peaceful, allowing trade in both directions. But when violence erupted, this fortlet would have been on red alert. A couple of dozen soldiers were posted here, and their job was to patrol the small gap in the otherwise impermeable barrier that was Hadrian's Wall. These guys got to decide who crossed from the Roman Empire to the beyond, and vice versa. So while Michael's busy exploring on foot, I'm flying further along the wall, trying to understand exactly what it was for, with the help of local archaeologist Justin Blake. When was the wall built, Justin? Well, we know for definite that it was under construction in 122 AD, and it was given on the orders of the, the Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian basically ring fences the Roman Empire, deciding a complete change of policy from expansion to consolidation and uh, holding what we had. Yeah. It all makes sense when you're above it. They were literally holding the line for mile after mile. And there were thousands of soldiers doing that from all over the Roman Empire. So where did they live? Here we are, we're just approaching Housestead's fort, and as we fly now over the top of the fort, you can see the headquarters building right in the central, two granaries, and then the Praetorium, the commander's house where him and his family would have lived. And then to the left, we've got what's called the Valetudinarium, which is a hospital for soldiers. Oh, really? And then in the northeast corner of the fort, we've got the barrack blocks. It could be brutally cold on this frontier, so how miserable did it get? Michael's going to take a ground-level look at the detailed evidence of how they lived here. Did they have any creature comforts? I've come here for two reasons, both more domestic than military. The first is to find, even here at the edges of the Roman Empire, an example of the famed Roman underfloor heating system. And the second, well, that's more private. In the 2nd century AD, this fort would have been home to 800 soldiers. In charge of the lot of them was the commanding officer, who, not surprisingly, got the best quarters. It was the largest single building at Housesteads, and along with his own stables, kitchen and latrines, the commanding officer got his own underfloor heating system to keep his tootsies warm in winter, something no other soldier here at the barracks got. And the way it worked was this, here's the floor level, and it was supported on these tall posts that allowed underneath for hot air created by fires that way to come this way and heat up the room. The perfect underfloor heating system. Over in the southeast corner of Housesteads is the other archaeological gem I've come here to see. Welcome to a Roman toilet. No individual cubicles here, this was a communal affair. The chaps would come in, sit down on benches running all the way round here, maybe have a chat, do their business, and when they were done to clean themselves, no toilet paper, they would take a sponge on the end of a stick, dip it in fresh running water that would be running along these drains all the way around, clean themselves and head off. Now where was this fresh water coming from? Well, the Romans decided to take advantage of the traditionally bad British weather and collect rainwater in cisterns. And we can even follow the path of where this fresh water comes from to the cistern conveniently placed right next to the toilet. Heading further down the wall now, and we've covered about 35 miles, the halfway point. All along here, the wall and the forts really give you a feeling of military occupation. Armies need supplies, of course, so I'm guessing there were local traders around here too. And I know some of the soldiers had families. Where did they all live? So what is just ahead of us here, Justin? Well, just ahead of us, this is Bindalanda Roman Fort. That is just huge. It really is. It's an extensive site. It goes on for around about seven to nine acres. And of course, we still haven't finished digging it out, so we don't really know exactly how far it extends.
This is the crown jewel of Roman archaeology in the north. What's so exciting about this place is that in the summer digging season, something turns up nearly every day. So I'm going to join in. Vindolanda was first excavated by Eric Burley over 40 years ago. Today, his grandson Andrew is the lead archaeologist here. This is just looking extraordinary, just right here. I mean, this is what early, early wooden walls, yeah. wattle and daub walls, woven construction with uprights. And the preservation down here is absolutely phenomenal. The mud holds it together, but there's no air down here, no oxygen, so no bacteria, no rust. So you find something down here, should be more or less in the same condition that they left it in almost 2,000 years ago. And Trudy, what are you doing over here? Like, how, how does the process work? It gets dug out of the area, brought over into the, the wheelbarrow. Um, we've had nut shells in here, we get oyster shells. Oyster shell, is that a, a fairly usual thing to find? Yes, in, in fact, I have another one here. Amazing. So this was a lunch, a, a rather nice lunch or dinner that was had by somebody along the way? Yes, it wasn't a delicacy as much in the past. Absolutely Lovely thing to find. Yeah, and it's one of those things that takes you that. right to the people, you know, this yeah. is what they're actually eating. Yeah. In fact, the Romans brought a wide variety of foods to Britain. Pheasants, rabbits, all sorts of herbs and spices. Plums, asparagus, leeks, peas. And my pet hate, cabbages. Thanks a lot, Romans. And if you push the spade forward, it should come out, hopefully, in a nice big chunk. It should well, be I'll give just, you a bit of a yeah, hand. Yeah, do you want to go for a... Lift that up. Oh, there. wow, yeah, that's coming as a nice big piece. Yeah. Right. And then we'll take another cut down yeah. on the same score. In fact, look at that. You've... My God, there's a piece in there, there's there, a isn't piece it? of leather tent right in there. Do you want to... So they take some oh of the stuff God, off that? Yeah, that's extraordinary. And let's just tease it out, yeah. And as you say, I mean, we're handling part of an early tent that was ten here. Man, ten man tent, ten you man know, tent. effectively, yeah. Yeah, best thing to do there is if we take a little bit of this dirt off. Now, if you're going to make a lot of money in the Roman Empire, become a goat farmer, because they need millions of goats to keep the Roman army under canvas. OK. Yeah, and that's the sort of the true colour of the of the thing coming through there. Oh, wow. So I'm holding part of a tent, a 2,000-year-old piece of goat hide, and it feels as soft as the day it was made. And to think this has survived this long, just waiting to be found. Absolutely extraordinary. The Romans built their first fort here in the mid-'80s, before the wall and some of the museum pieces go right back. There are Roman coins, beads and brooches, a leather headdress for a horse, and the largest collection of Roman shoes in the world, over four and a half thousand of them, some for women and children. I really want to find out where on earth they were living. So just beyond the fort walls here, there, there's a few sort of straggly buildings as such. What were they for? Well, that's all part of what they call a vicus, which is a civilian village that sprang up outside the fort walls. You may have retired soldiers that are trying to sell things to their former messmates. You may have Celtic traders that are attracted in by the military money. And some of the wives and families of the soldiers themselves would have been living in houses outside the barracks. Eh? And it's a real big, bustling community. Equally as many people inside the Vicus as there are inside the fort itself. Incredible, yeah. This then was the life of a major Roman settlement just behind Hadrian's Wall in the 3rd century AD. With its headquarters, granaries and barracks, the fort was home to 600 soldiers, all taught to write and speak Latin they must have been amongst the most literate troops in the entire Roman Empire. I've absolutely loved this fantastic journey I've been on around Roman Britain. From the air, I've understood for the first time the sheer scale of Hadrian's Wall. I've discovered a Roman Wales I didn't know existed. And I've seen bits of Roman London you just can't get on the ground. By the time the Romans left Britain, around 410 AD, they put their stamp on this country and changed its character forever. 
For most of the time they were here, Britain wasn't a war zone, but a peaceful outpost of the empire. They raised families here, farmed the land, and for a time they integrated with the local people to create a new Romano-British society. And that's the message, I guess, that I'll be taking away from the for all the violence, the Romans brought with them an example of civilization that bedded down here, mixed in with all sorts of local traditions and which surfaces in our lives still again and again, yeah. sometimes in the most unexpected of places. Of course, I mean, their legacy is everywhere. The, the Roman roads, the central heating, the amphitheater, the forts, all of their letters and coins and shoes. Britain has a fabulous hoard of Roman leftovers. And of course, we're still eating peas and cabbage. That says it all to me. <laughs> Rennie Zellweger, Colin Firth and Hugh Grant star in the movie Bridget Jones' Diary over on ITV2 next. While over on ITV Encore, a spooky country manor provides the location for a murder mystery in Agatha Christie's Marple. Can money buy your happiness? Well, we're about to find out in Lottery Stories. Be careful what you wish for. Here next. Later in our journey, we'll visit Wales and the north of England, but our story starts in London. Believe it or not, London is a Roman invention. There was nothing here until the Romans arrived. They built it all from scratch. In 43 AD, the Romans landed an invasion army of 40,000 men on the Kent coast. Just four years later, they started work on a new town they called Londinium, exactly where today's City of London stands. Of course, with all the crazy chaos of modern London, it's easy to forget that every day we walk in the footsteps of our Roman ancestors, and their city lies just a few feet underground. So how much do you know about Roman London? Very little, if I'm being completely Michael honest. knows his stuff on the Romans, but I've got a lot to find out. What London looked like then, who lived in the town, and really fascinating, why the Romans built the town here. First off, I want to know what's left of Roman London, so I've asked archaeologist Nick Bateman to join me in the air. So Nick, what can we see today? of what is left of, of the Roman streets. are blue, the sun is shining and I'm about to go on the most fabulous and very original journey around Britain. And what makes it so unusual is that it's not actually today's Britain I'll be seeing, but the Britain of nearly 2,000 years ago when this country, or most of it, was part of the Roman Empire. So while I'm having fun up in the air... I'll be having an equally great time here on the ground tracking down the fascinating remains of Roman Britain that are still all around us. We'll be revealing the world of the Romans like you have never seen it before. Finding bits of Roman London hidden away where you'd least expect. It's pretty much the most impressive piece of the Roman War that I've ever seen. From the air, we can see how Roman streets and towns sit cheek by jowl with 21st century Britain. And we uncover some of the dirtier truths about everyday life on Hadrian's Wall at the edge of the Roman Empire. It's just huge! This is the story of what life was like back then, for the Romans and for the Britons. Roman Britain is under our feet. It's in the country's great museums. But the most exciting way to see it is... From the air. But we also get the chance to see these red 
tile courses that run at regular intervals that gave the wall extra strength and stability. With finds like this, I'm well on my way to becoming a Roman wall addict. The wall was 20 feet high and up to nine feet thick. It surrounded London on just three sides because the fourth boundary was the River Thames. Up here, you get a unique sense of how the river still defines London today. But 2,000 years ago, it looked very different and presented a real challenge to Roman engineers. What we're looking at now is, is a relatively constrained and narrow river. It's embanked on both sides, and those embankments have made the river deeper and much, much narrower uh, than what it was when the Romans came. The north bank um, has moved a fair amount, and in fact, where the river bank was in the Roman period is more or less along the line of Lower and Upper Thames Street. But the south bank, the change is even more extraordinary. What we look at now was a series of small islands and tidal marshy ground. The tidal basin might have been as much as a mile in width. By threading their way through from, from island to island, they could throw a bridge across, a timber bridge. It then becomes a very handy place to start a very effective port and harbour. And it was because they could put a bridge across the Thames and build a port that the Romans sighted their town here. I'm right in saying, Nick, that there is part of the wall in underneath the ground. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we can't see it from up here, obviously, but I'm hoping Michael is down there investigating it right now. Well, this is weird. I'm in an NCP car park in the heart of the city, and I'm joining archaeologist Neil Faulkner, who claims there's a Roman surprise in store for me just up ahead. In you go. Fantastic. What a place. I have never seen this before. Face to face with Roman London. This is the western wall of the Roman fort, Londinium's military headquarters. What's that over there? That looks like a very different kind of structure. That is the AD 200 wall that goes right the way around the city. Yeah. What they do is they incorporate the fort into the city wall. Let me show you on the map. Okay. It's much clearer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it gets incorporated into this huge great wall running all the way around the city. So that's covering everything from you know, what is today here, St Paul's Cathedral, yep. all the way over to what, Tower, Tower of London. London. Yeah, so it's the whole of the kind of what becomes the city of London as we know it. It's frankly astonishing just how much of the Roman London wall is visible in London's underground car parks. Here we are in Bay 52, and in amongst the motorbikes and the cars, it's pretty much the most impressive piece of the Roman wall that I've ever seen. Not only its height gives you a real sense of just what an extraordinary structure this was. Roman London actually lies buried anything between 10 and 20 feet below the level that we walk on nowadays. However, the key elements of the Roman streetscape are actually mirrored and reflected uh, in in modern streets. From up here, it's really obvious. The Romans were famous for building straight roads. And down below us, where all those buses are, there is one. London's most famous shopping street, Oxford Street. The Romans knew it as the Via Trinobantina, and it headed west towards South Wales. At the far end is Marble Arch. Even in Roman times, this was a hub of several roads including what we call today Edgware Road, a major Roman highway to the north. Roman towns usually had a simple plan. As well as the straight roads, a large town like London would need a fort and a town wall. So could there be any signs of those that I can spot from the air? Most of the Roman wall has gone, but I'm told there's a section of it still standing somewhere near the Tower of London. Well, I can see the tower, so where's the Roman wall? Absolutely spectacular. 
It is incredible, Nick, after all these years that you can still manage to rediscover parts of the Roman world, really, here in central London. Pretty so amazing, isn't it? By some miracle, this section of the huge Roman wall that surrounded London has survived. So what happened to the rest?